Hi everyone, welcome to St. Matthias, the Apostle Catholic Church's studio. My name is Father Michael Dank. I'm the pastor here, and I'm very delighted today to have with me Deacon Lou Promosik, who's going to be telling us about some of the great work that he does and how you may be wanting to get involved with it. Deacon Lou, welcome. Father, thank you. It's a privilege to be here, and I greatly, greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity, and uh, I'm very thankful for all the people and the parishioners of St. Matthias who support us in lots of different ways through donations, as well as uh, financial gifts and volunteers. So uh, St. Matthias has been very, very good to I'm in ministry. Yeah, and um, they're the reason you're here. All my parishioners have been talking about you and just telling me about the good work that I'm in ministry does. So uh, I want to thank you just for being here. I also want to thank our sponsors. So we have a sponsor, All Saints Federal Credit Union, and they're it's located at the same column kill. They have three different locations. But if you're looking for any kind of loan, I love it because they're people that you can trust. And even if you don't know what you're doing, especially if you're younger, uh, you can just go there to them and they'll help you out. And if you uh, sign up, they'll give you a free gas card and just mention St. Matthias. They'll even give you a discount on your credit. Thank you very much. Um, Deacon Lou, I've been hearing such... Uh, I think, miraculous stories about everything that you are doing with I'm in ministry, and we were talking before, and uh, I thought it was kind of like, I'm in ministry, but you told me that it actually came out because people would say, whatever you're doing, I'm in. Correct. And so it, it's like, I'm in ministry. Well, it started out years ago, about 13 years ago when we started, and we were just kind of deciding what we would do, and uh, a great shout out and, and a great appreciation to Father Walt Jenny, who was a pastor at St. Basil's, and that's where I had the been legendary Father Walt Jenny for 16 years with him. So uh, he and I are very dear friends. And then Father uh, Jim O'Donnell, yeah, who is just a, a champion of of serving the poor. And so as we started that whole early conversation, I went out and I just started interviewing people and just giving some general ideas of what we would do, not specifics. And people would say, I'm in, repeatedly. And I kept hearing that over and over, and I thought, I figured out the name. It's I'm in That's ministry. That's so awesome. And so today, a lot of the volunteers who, who come in to I'm in ministry or people who donate, they'll say, I'm in. You know, so it's just kind of like a catchphrase for everybody. That means they mean that they're, they're in and they're committed to doing the work of the Lord. And when, I, when I hear that, uh, I'm in... I just see that as a movement of the Holy Spirit. Like, it is. There's just some inner conviction that they don't know what it even means, that journey for them, but they're in. Well, to add to the Holy Spirit, so all of the volunteers and staff wear an I'm in ministry shirt uh, that has our logo on it, but the shirts are red oh, to cool. represent really? the Holy Spirit. And so it's not by accident. That's awesome. So all of the, the people that are out picking up the furniture and all the volunteers... They all wear red shirts that wow. we provide to them that have I'm in ministry. And um, so we're not bashful about promoting I'm in, but at the same time, we're not bashful about promoting our faith. What's kind of interesting is, is a couple months ago, I was handing out the book Holy, uh, Holy Moments, mm -hmm. right? One of Kelly's books. And so we handed them out to all our volunteers. And now what happens when the trucks are leaving to go on a delivery to serve somebody that's really, really su suffering and struggling in ways beyond our, our imagination, uh, volunteers will say, another holy moment, mm -hmm. meaning that here's this truck going out to serve somebody that is uh, in very, very difficult situations. And, um, and we see heartaches every day uh, when we're out serving people in Northeast Ohio. And um, so the question people ask me often is, you know, well, how did this all happen, and what's it all about? And so the why of I'm in ministry is pretty simple. Our vehicles, our website, and, and everything we produce, it says the why. And the why is we are all children of God. Mm -hmm. We need to be present to one another so we can learn from one another. That's the why. We're all children of God. We believe it. We promote it. We talk about it every day. And the... The how we do that is we are non-judgmental. We don't ask how you got to where you're at. Yeah. We are respectful, we're kind, and we encourage hope. And so the, the why and the how are directly connected. And then what we do is we repurpose furniture where we move 500 pieces every five days 
and we do thousands and thousands of people a year. And one of your parishioners, uh, on Monday, I happened to be at the house with our pickup team, and I got there early, and she's a, a parishioner at St. Matthias, lives on Hickory, Hickory Drive, I think is the street. She donated a couch and a love seat. And she showed me your bulletin saying, because I asked this, we always ask, well, how'd you find out about us? She shows oh, me your cool. bulletin, and there's I am administering your bulletin. So thank you. A great that's shout awesome. out to, great. to that wonderful donor. So we, the, what we do is we purpose furniture. And about 85% of what we bring in would have gone into a landfill. Mm. We fix it, we repair it, we paint it, we clean it, repurpose it out, and deliver it to people who greatly, greatly appreciate it. And so that's what we do. In the wintertime, we have a winter program that starts September 15th. We run it through the beginning of May, and it's all winter clothing. So we just typically don't take regular clothes throughout the year. We focus on winter, and so for children as well as adults. And we put out thousands of pieces of winter clothing. Wow. You know, one of the, the things that uh, our volunteers will remark is that we go down to Norma Her, which is a women's shelter uh, down in Prospect. 200 women live in that shelter, and there's usually 20 women outside that can't get in that are sleeping outside in tents or boxes. And we'll go down there, and we'll put 200 coats on the backs of those women. Oh, wow. Every December. And you just look at them, and they say to me and our volunteers, God bless you. Mm. They're blessing us. Yeah. And so uh, very humbling. And so that is what we do. And, and the who is from the homeless people at Norma Her to referrals that come out of Tasa Cancer Center at the Cleveland Clinic, Seidman Cancer, Metro Health, people who have serious health issues that come to Cleveland and are here for an extended period of time. And what we end up doing is we provide the furniture for the places they have to rent because they got to pay their rent and their mortgage back home, but they're yeah. going to be here for treatment purposes. Wow. And so we do that. We do Christ Child Society. We've done over 1,700 beds for them since 2019. And we have referrals coming from many different organizations. We do with people who are the unsheltered, to the people who are domestic violence, to house fires, to survivors of human sex trafficking. And over the years, what I have learned, uh, people that we serve make me better. Mm -hmm. They take me to a place in which we're all children of God. And it's just a great reminder. They give me the humility. They teach me things. Um, and what I've learned is bad things do happen to good people. Yeah. And it's the good people that we see and bad things that happen to them. And it just reminds me that mm. what we do, why we do it, how we do it, is exactly what Jesus did. And, you know, it's just a, it's pretty simple for us. You know, if you go into a relationship, non-judgmental, respectful, kind, and encourage hope, it's easy. And that's what we focus on. It's very, very easy. But if we always think, be it our volunteers, who, quite frankly, we have probably 45, 50 volunteers that make a huge difference because we couldn't afford to have that number of people on the payroll. Um, and the staff that we have and all the people, they buy into the idea and the notion that we're all children of God. And if you, if you focus on that, the heavy lifting is not heavy. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes people say, I'm in ministry makes the impossible possible, but it's through people in your parish who support us and other parishes. It's people who donate. It's people who give financial gifts. It's people who join us in, in really working, doing the work of the Lord. We had a volunteer interviewed recently, and somebody asked him, why do you do this? The person without hesitation said, I'm doing the work of God. Hmm. And so that's what we try to create is that spirit, and we believe deeply that we are truly driven by the Holy Spirit. I, I like the um, presence being in there, the ministry of presence. Uh, so Father Jim O'Donnell I've known for years, and that was kind of his 
charism. Correct. He just wanted to be present. He lived downtown. He lived in the inner city. And his priesthood and ministry was dedicated just to be there. He, You're right. And so the the back of, of the truck about being present is attributable to him. And it's actually in honor of him and in respect wow. of him. You know, um, I go visit him uh, on, a, on a regular basis, and, um, you know, it's his mind is sharp, and he understands. But really what that presence about it is, he not only showed up, he stayed. Mm. Right? Yeah. And so what we try to do is we can't stay with the 14,000 people we're going to serve this year. We show up. We're respectful. We're kind. We follow up with them. And what we do is we brag about them. Because oftentimes people who are economically, socially disadvantaged, people who suffer from mental health issues or addictions and so on, people shy away from them. Oh, yeah. yeah. We embrace them. They make us better. Children of God. We're present to them. They're present to us. And that's what's really important. It's a two-way street. It's not just we're putting stuff out. But what we get back is beyond words. And... Um, and I think that's the work of, of, of God, just puts us in places. And every morning I pray for the people we've served and those we're called to serve, because I think God's calling us to serve people. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I don't believe in coincidences. And, um, and so with I Am In Ministry, it's, it's that. It's about the volunteers. It's about the people we serve. It's about everybody, not about me. Mm-hmm. It's truly so one of the things that, that happened, uh, and I think you'll appreciate this, before you were ordained, you should go on a retreat. So uh, a little over 19 years ago, I went on a retreat just before being ordained with my class. And as we finished up the retreat, we're going into Mass, this little chapel. I walk in the chapel. Nobody's there. I sit down, and there's a little card next to the seat, and it says, what you are is God's gift oh, to yeah. you. What you become is your gift to God. Now, here I am about three weeks out before ordination. That hit me like a lightning bolt. I have distributed thousands of those cards. But where I'm at today with I Am In Ministry and all that's happened, all the people involved, all the people we've served, I say this often now, is I Am In Ministry is a gift from God. What we do, everybody, the volunteers, the donors, Mm. the benefactors, the ambassadors, the people we serve, and so on. What we do is our gift back to God. And I believe that deeply. And so I believe about being committed to these ideas. Jesus gave us the roadmap. The gospel's a verb. And if you get to that point, it's really simple and it's really easy. And, um, and that's what we do. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so it's, I have the privilege of being here with you. I have the privilege of working with your parishioners and a lot of people throughout Northeast Ohio every day. And I have the, the true privilege of working with people that we serve. I've received more hugs than I deserve. And I have, um, it's been humbling. It's been humbling. And, um, I think that's where, where God says, this is where you're supposed to be. We, in our diocese, we have a mission team in El Salvador. And so I've been down there a number of times. And one of the insights that I've had over the years is that it's what you said. And there's a phrase that we kind of use for that. It's reverse mission. So we go down there to minister, but we find that we're, we're the ones being ministered to, Right. It, it is, and uh, Father Reedy is uh, involved yeah. with us at, at Iowa oh, Ministry. Oh, yes, he's uh, he's been a great referral source, and we go back and forth mm-hmm. and help one another. But it it is, you know, I think that the it's it's sad what we see, be it El Salvador, Honduras, or in the streets of Greater Cleveland. It's yeah. sad, um, but God puts us there for a reason, and not to just walk by and say, "Well, let somebody else worry about it." It's you know, what you know, when you know it, and what you do about it. And so it is, is that what I find is, uh, is being non-judgmental helps greatly. And um, I, I oftentimes will say that, you know, we're downtown and we're at Cosgrove Center and places like that where we're, we do a lot of work. And I said, you know, people drive by and I'll say, oh, people are just, 
they don't want to work, they're lazy, and so on. It's not it. Mm-hmm. It's an example of mental health. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so we see mental health issues today. Um, just it's the new pandemic, in my view. Right. That it happens over and over, uh, and it could happen to anyone at any point yeah. in life. And so we serve, you know, more and more people like that. The other thing we do, and and uh, um, we spend a lot of time on this, is so we put furniture in houses. We do over a thousand beds a year. You know, thousands of couches and chairs. What we do is because we're in the house, we take it the next step. You know, that furniture is going to depreciate at some point. But what we do is for preschool, we have a preschool literacy program. So we take books from the Imagination Library. Dolly Parton does a million. Oh, that's five right. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. The books that wow. don't get delivered, we get. And so we work with Literacy Cooperative. We get the books. So we take about three to 500 books, 300 to 500 books a month in the homes. And then we put flashcards in. A for Apple, B for Ball, and all that's phonics, like mm-hmm. the basics. And then we use cognitive puzzles. We put them in the house. So what we're doing is saying, yeah, that new bed, that chair is great. All this is great, but it's about learning. So we're introducing early learning concepts in the house. It's, what's interesting is most of the moms read at maybe a third or fourth grade oh, level. Oh, right, yeah. And so all of a sudden we we utilize every opportunity in the house that we can. So, you know, when we get in there, everybody's happy because they got furniture. People are not sleeping on the floor again. But we take it one step. And I think that's the the what we need to we do it. We need to continue to do more of it. And we have a couple of new initiatives that we'll be doing that uh, here at, at the beginning of the um, the new school year. We're going to have kids um, at St. Basil's at the summer program. They, they've committed to doing this, and then throughout the school year, we're going to go to different schools, uh, public and Catholic schools, and we're going to say we want fourth graders and fifth graders to make flashcards. Give them to us, and then it'll be kids helping kids because we'll deliver those flashcards, introducing phonics to kids that are disadvantaged. Mm. It's easy. It's easy to do. And so not only are we recognized for the furniture delivery, which we do a lot of, um, but it's I want to be recognized for more than that. I want to be recognized, and I think people realize that you know we don't hide about being faithful people. We're very ecumenical, but we're all about God. We all talk about Jesus. I bring the good book out. We produce and probably distribute 500 Bibles a year. And on the cover inside it says, Inside, we have a I'm in ministry logo. It says promises, hopes, and dreams. That's what the Bible's about. Yeah. And so we're not bashful. And what we find is people are very receptive. So that new pillow, that new blanket, that couch, that chair, whatever mm-hmm. it is, I take the message of the Lord in, and I put the learning aids in, and we're looking at putting other things in so it becomes a true holy moment. And that is holiness. It's the whole person. You know, you're, you're, you're not just giving them something. You're, you're helping them in, in many ways to flourish. Um, and I think part of the, the, you're not just giving something, but there's a relationship there, right? They become real people. That's right. It's, it's children of God are real people. Yeah. Right? And so that relationship is one in which we work at building a trust, so if we are non-judgmental, respectful, kind, and encourage hope, that person we just help is going to tell a sibling, a friend, a neighbor, and they're going to call us and say, you know, they treat us fair, they're non-judgmental, they're kind, they're respectful, and they encourage hope. I want to meet those folks. And that's our mission. We want to be able to meet as many people as we can. Mm. So it's to, to every day to you know, the why of what we do and how we go about it every day, that's the focal point. So I'm going to kind of throw a curveball at you maybe, put you on the spot. And I think I'm gaining an answer already from what I'm hearing from you. A big common question from Catholics with the poor, what, what do I do with the person that's on the street corner begging? Mm-hmm. What do I do? My answer is real simple. It's the answer of Jesus Christ. What what did Jesus do? 
what did he teach us to do? And he showed us how to do it. And so that person on the street, you know, sure, people hustle, right? Mm -hmm. Most people on the street, they're there because they need to be there, or they're there because they're suffering from something. It could be addiction. It could be mental health. It could be a combination of all of the above, right? And so I think that it's, it's easy to say, I'm not going to do this because I'm uncomfortable or maybe because they're, uh, you know, they're going to use the money for, for drugs mm -hmm, or alcohol, mm -hmm. whatever, okay? I don't spend a second on that. What I think about is Jesus didn't walk by people and say, somebody else is going to help you or help yourself. He didn't. In Scripture, you don't find Jesus just passing people by and saying, hey, too bad for you. And so that answer is one in which I try to live by. And I think about it all the time. I'll say, what, you know, what did Jesus do? How mm -hmm. did he do it? What did he say? But most importantly, how did he teach me to do it by the example? Because those examples make it very, very clear. Every once in a while, somebody will call me and say, um, hey, you know, uh, I'd like to donate, but, you know, you're sure this is going to go to people mm -hmm. that are going to appreciate yeah, yeah. it? I get that question maybe three times a year. So thousands of people we help, three times a year I get it. My answer is this. I don't spend a second thinking about it. It doesn't matter to me. And then I'll say, I'd rather have, if that's true, if somebody's taking advantage, I'd rather have them take advantage of me and I am in ministry than somebody can't afford to be taken advantage uh, of. Yeah. But I don't believe it. I don't spend time on You've it. Even thinking about I it. I don't dwell on it. I just go back to saying, you know, Jesus had it right, right? And he, he gave me the, he showed me, he told me, and he said, now just do it, right? And so I think it's, I said, you know, Jesus taught us how to do it, right? And so if we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, we be, if we're believers, but more importantly, trusting. Do we trust God? Hmm. Did we, do we trust Jesus? Then it's a non-issue. You just do it. You give him what you got, and you wish him well and say, God bless you. That's what That's you do. A, I, I've never heard such a clear, <laughs> good answer to that question. So thank you for that. You put it in a homily. <laughs> <laughs> I will now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I used to, when I was a seminarian, we always have different, pro, uh, not projects, um, in internships or exposures to different things. And I was always very uncomfortable with homeless people. And I, uh, Father Don Dunson, I'm sure you know. I do. Uh, was Great a, person. Become a dear friend, but he... My first, my first experience was with him at the Westside Catholic Center. Mm -hmm. And one of his big things was, go sit over there and have lunch with them. Don't just serve them. Go over there. And it got me over that fear yes. and uncomfortability and just un unknown, I think, of it all. And so as I hear you talking, too, I think for people that feel that way, have not had any exposure or like learned properly how to just relate mm -hmm. to people... Mm -hmm that I'm in ministry could be a way that they learn that. We have a lot of, um, over the last couple of years, the number of young people, college, high school, uh, for service hours, they come to us. So St. Ed's, usually it's the entire sophomore class rotate in and out. And we get young men from Ignatius and some you know, Magnificat, so all the schools, even Archbishop Hoban. Um, so we're on the list for, you need service hours. Yeah, oh right? yeah. And uh, so what we end up doing is we find that we explain and show them what they do, right? And I have to tell you, I'm inspired by young people. They get it. They want to be service-oriented. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that what happens is you have to have um, take a little risk. So this morning at I'm in Ministry, we have a woman uh, came in. She wants to be a new volunteer. So she's spending the day at I'm in Ministry. And, um, and I just said, don't give up on us, you know. Nothing's perfect. Just trust. Okay. You know, just trust us, right? And, um, and, and she'll find her niche within I yeah, Ministry. Yeah. But I think back to the homeless. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that I have learned. There's a gentleman by the name of Jim Schlecht. And Jim is a 25-year guy, 
out in the field. He's in the woods. He's off by the railroad tracks, under the bridges, and so on with the unsheltered population. Mm -hmm. And so I go out with him frequently. And so what I've learned is that it's to the point of being present to people, right? And so how you make the approach and so on and so forth. And um, people live outside sometimes out of desire because they don't want to be inside. Right, right. There's other issues going on. Restrictions and yeah. And so, so what happens is what Jim says to every one of them when we leave, I love you. And that may be, and I've watched it over the years, and sometimes my reaction is I'm looking at the person is that may be the first time anybody ever said, I love you. Yeah. And so I took that example of Jim over the years, and we do prayer cards. So I write a prayer card, you know, and we distribute thousands of them a year. And I learned from Jim and others, and I learned from the people we serve. Keep it simple. Speak like Jesus, right? Don't try to be overcomplicating things, right? So we write a, a, a note on a prayer card, an index card we produce. Jesus believes in you. Hmm. Jesus loves you. Jesus needs you. And what people will look at it, and they don't have to like, what does that mean? And what I found over the years is when they'll look at the card and it says, Jesus believes in you. They'll look at that and look at me and say, Jesus believes in me? Yes. And I think that's a message that we continue to put out. But you know, it's one that we should put out to everybody mm -hmm. because people go to church every Sunday and they, they're not like, do you really realize Jesus believes you? Jesus loves you for who you are at the moment. You may not like the behavior, but you, as a child of God, Jesus believes in you, Jesus loves you. And I think simple messages like that is what we're all about. But I've watched the people who are unsheltered, and it's just amazing to see their, their reaction. And so for those who are uncomfortable and hesitant, come to I'm in ministry. We'll take you out in the field. We'll show you how it works. But at the same time, but talk to other people, you know, and just kind of take a little bit more of a risk. You know, Jesus was a risk taker. Big time, okay? yeah. Jesus was an entrepreneur, you know. And uh, Jesus what do you mean went, by that? Jesus well, Jesus was an went out into the, he went out and said, I'm going to do something that's never been done before. Okay, I'm going to tell people that, you know, I'm going to give it all up for you. I'm going to tell people that our Father God loves you. And I'm going to take that message out and share that message every day of my life. So you need to be entrepreneurial because not everybody believed, not everybody followed. A lot, a lot of people didn't be, you know, believe them, mm -hmm. right? And so it takes that little entrepreneurial you know, flair, right? And I will call the flair you know, God's hand guiding, but, but Jesus had it, right? And I just, I just find his words to be very simplistic, we complicated, right? Jesus wasn't a theologian. We complicated. Keep it simple. Hmm. So I think that as we, as people who are thinking about it, have reasonable expectations. Don't expect when you go serve a poor person, they're going to give you a hug and say, oh, thank you. Thank you, Father Mike, for being right. here. If it wasn't for you, I'd be... Forget about that. You may not get a thank you. You may not get anything. But to be present to somebody to say, you know, here's, here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or here's something else that I want to give you, without any strings attached. Yeah. So what we do is for our volunteers, you know, and they're wonderful. We couldn't do what we do, is they get it, right? There's no strings attached. Don't expect anything back, right? But I oftentimes will say to somebody who donates a piece of furniture, I'll say, when you get to heaven, somebody walks up to you and says, thank oh, you. Oh, wow. Wow. And you're going to say, who are you? I'm the person that got wow. the couch you donated or the chair or the bed. I believe that deeply. Because if we follow the message, right? If we believe, if we trust in what God's telling us and God did with his son, if we follow and believe it, that's that what happens. That is so beautiful. 
And so I think what happens is our reward is our eternal reward. Somebody bumps up to you and say, hey, Father Mike, thank you. And you look, for what? You opened a door for me so it was easy for me to get into church. Or you helped me in confession. Or you just smiled and said, have a good day. Yeah. It's the simple things. I think about that entrepreneurial spirit and um, on a faith-based thing, it reminds me of um, Mother Teresa's call within a call. In baptism, mm-hmm. we are, we're called, we have the vocation to holiness. Correct. But in the midst of our life, we also discover, hopefully, a call within that call mm-hmm. in some way to become an entrepreneur in, in a way that God has created us that no human being ever ever has what God has given to you. Mm -hmm. And as I think about the different volunteers that you have, there's no probably no same volunteer, right? Correct. They bring their own all their own gifts gifts and talents and enormous gifts and talents. And they bring patience because they're patient with me. (laughs) Because I'm the entrepreneur. Uh, and so um, they 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 bring all of that. And what it what it reminds me is, to your point in baptism, right? We're called to go forward, right, mm-hmm. and be disciples. We're called. Don't sit in your room. We're called to go out of the room, as uncomfortable as it may be, and that's what we're called to do. And I think they get it. They find that as as a way in which people will talk to me and say, "I am fulfilling my baptismal call." Yeah. Right. I'm doing what I should be doing as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and they get it. Right, they really do, but it's at some point you got to take that first step, and sometimes for some people it's you got to crawl first, right? And you got to, you know, you just got to mm-hmm. slowly but surely get there. And when you get involved in organizations, uh, be it Catholic Charities, I mean Ministry, Christ Child Society, lots of wonderful organizations, uh, Westside Catholic Center. What's what's helpful there is that you start to meet people that make it a little easier and say, look. Mm-hmm. You know, the first couple hours here is going to be crazy. Yeah, uh, right. Maybe yeah, the first uh-huh. couple weeks. But no, <laughs> don't give up on us, right? Yeah. Don't give up on us. And I think that helps people who are not sure how to get involved. And, um, and when you have a bad experience at an organization, right, mm-hmm. don't give up on the call to say, oh, that was a bad experience. I'm not. Find yeah. another organization. Find mm-hmm. another one until you find and say, this is where I should be. And... Um, and it's just, it's, that's what Jesus, you know, when Jesus was out in, in Corinth, right, that was a real tough neighborhood, by the way, mm-hmm. all right? They weren't buying the message, the first visit, right? You know, you had every bad habit on planet Earth, right? Continue you go back, though. He went back. And he didn't say, hey, I'm done here because you're not buying it, or this is uncomfortable for me, or... I feel threatened or insecure about it or I'm afraid for my life, he went back. Mm. And so the people who are really called, and if they can get there to be called to say, may not be the right thing, or in the parishes that they're in, they may decide that, hey, I'm going to do something, and if they don't like it, don't give up. Right, stick find another ministry. It's, or... it's stick to the mission, and the mission is you're called. Yeah. Right. You're called to do something to be Christ-like. And... Then my experience, when you embrace that, many, many opportunities present themselves. And what you get from that is what you experience in El Salvador. You get more back. I get more back in helping people than I could ever give. They make me better every day. You know? and, and so for me, it's simple. So here's my, 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 my rule that I kind of try to live by. It's... It's today I need to be better than yesterday, tomorrow better than today. I could sit back and complain about a lot of things, but it's not going to change a lot of things. But if I work on myself and, and try to be a better version of myself tomorrow than today, today better than yesterday, that's what, that's what the call is about. Yeah. And I think that and, and God gives us all the tools that we need and the graces that we need to do that. If we trust God, mm-hmm. see, I think that is is we can believe, right? But you only go so far. You trust. You go all the way. Yeah. 
And so I think that the... That's the stirring of amen, right? It, just, it's, it's the people who, who get involved, the people who we serve, trust us, the people donate, the person on Hickory Drive mm -hmm. here in Seven Hills, she trusts us, and she trusts the person that's going to get this couch um, that her husband used to sit in, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, and she showed me the uh. corner where he sat. She trusts. And so it's to be able to trust in, in all of these relationships. But if we trust God, it gets easy. It really does. And so it's not, it's not uh, a heavy lift at all. And if we you know, one that, of the things I like teaching is discernment of spirits, helping people know the voice of God and when God is calling them to something. And one of the um, primary um, um, entries into that is consolation. So when, when God is calling you to something, there tends to be consolation. And St. Ignatius would describe that as an increase of faith, hope, and love. So I would imagine there's probably going to be viewers watching this right now who feel some kind of stirring, right? And I would say that is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit stirring, stirring something in you. And maybe they want to take a step. What, what could be a practical first step that they could do even if they're terrified. Sure. So the, the easy stuff is this. So, um, you know, you contact us, we bring you in, and we'll give you the walkthrough, right? And this is kind of what we do. And what I find is people gravitate towards what they want to do, mm -hmm. right? So um, I have people helping me in recruiting volunteers because I don't do a good job. Here's what happens. People say, uh, I want to volunteer. What do you need? I give them my three hot... My three pain points, right? I need people who can drive our trucks, our box truck. You know, I <laughs> yeah. need people on the road. You know, I'm, I'm getting them the three pain points, and it's like, whoa, that's that's a lot, you know. So I scare them away. So we have other people who work with them and just say, okay, here. And what what I've learned after interviewing a bunch of nonprofit organizations is how do you recruit and retain? the The message is let them come in and just expose them, and what'll happen is they're going to find what they want to do, mm -hmm. right? And so I'll give you an example. My brother retired uh, about a year ago. And so he comes in, and I didn't tell him, you know, go here, go there. And next thing you know, he's involved in the restoration of our, of our furniture, and he runs the bed program and all that. He just kind of gravitated towards that. It's huge for us. And so here's what happens. If they call us, we say, okay, if you're not sure... We're going to have you come in on a day when we got a lot of volunteers, and we're going to match up with a couple of volunteers. Yeah. So the volunteers, we call them ambassadors. Okay. Okay. So what will happen is we bring somebody in, they get connected with somebody, and next thing you know, they're talking, and back and forth they go. They make it easy, and they show them, hey, you going to come back next week or sometime later? Yes. It's slowly get them involved. And what would I turn around, next thing I know, the woman who was sorting winter clothing Next thing I know, she's painting furniture. How did that happen? Well, I never had the opportunity to paint furniture. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? And so um, we really um, let them work towards what they feel comfortable in doing. And the other thing with the volunteers, I will say to them, any idea you have that makes us better, I am all open for it. Wow. That's, I, that's I great. I am open. Anything that, because if, if you help, me get better if you help the organization get better we're going to do a better job of serving those who are disadvantaged mm -hmm. and so we're very very open to how do we continue to get better and better and better so we're not sitting by and saying well we've had some successes it's not that how do we prepare ourselves for the next family we're going to serve and um and i believe that's important so the volunteers it's just it's uh you know, try us at I'm a ministry, but try other places. I think in life we got to be engaged. Yeah. You know, and um, and I think that the, um, and I know a lot of parishes that I've worked with over the years, you know, um, they'll say, people want to do service. Oh, they do. Okay? They Yes. And, and we have a great parish um, that the pastor asked me to come out, and I preached uh, on, at the Masses on the weekend, and we had the I'm a ministry truck there, right? So we, you know, we're, we're ready to promote, right? Mm -hmm. And we got a bunch of volunteers, but the pastor said to me afterwards, he goes, look, people want to be involved in service. I don't have 
the capacity for here. that. Yeah. So I said, well, that's simple. You're now in. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we kind of partner up with this organization, and next thing you know, people come. They're volunteering. Uh, Saint Vincent de Paul Society. We have about twenty of them. I've never recruited them. They come and say, we're volunteers, we do whatever, and next thing you know, they're coming and helping, volunteering, different stuff, or they'll make referrals to us. So take the risk, take the chance, have a reasonable expectation. Don't get disappointed if it doesn't go your way. Stick with it. And I think that you will find that you get more than you will ever give. And, um, and it's truly that baptismal call that you mentioned. It's really living up to it. You know, when we get, when we get to, to, to the face of, of, of meeting God, you know, what are we going to say? You know, what are we really going to say? God's going to embrace us, but what are we going to say? Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be I could have or should have or would have. What I want to say, I did the best I had with yeah. what I had to work with. Yeah. That's it. That's all I got. I did, I try, I did my best, you know? And I think that would be, if I met God this afternoon, that would be when God looks at me, what do you have to say? Hmm. I, I did my best. And so I think in life, if we, we, you know, if we all did our best, think about how the world changes. You know, if we all said, I'm going to be a little less judgmental. I'm going to be a little bit more kind. I've noticed that throughout Greater Cleveland, they have kindness everywhere. You see it in a local yeah, paper. Yeah. Right? But how do you do it? You can do it through being a volunteer. Take the risk. You know, don't give up on people. You know, what's very um, interesting about you is that your background. So one of the things, too, I like, I, I want people to know that you don't have to keep your life and your job separate from ministry, right? So you had a very unique s- uh, set of gifts and talents, right, before you did all this. Correct. And you, f- you found or God found a way for you to begin using that to build up his kingdom. What was that like to discover that? So I think that, so, you know, from, from birth, right, I had loving parents. I have a brother. Um, but we were poor. You know, we were working poor family, right? And we grew up on the east side in the Collinwood neighborhood. Two family grandparents lived upstairs. We lived downstairs. My parents didn't even have a car, right? So there was no family vacations, mm-hmm. right? My vacation was on East 146th Street off of St. Clair in the summertime. And so all of that was a, a building process that I've learned as I got older. Now, I may not have liked it, right? Um, but I, it was a building process. So then in business, I was fortunate enough to have some successes. You know, we started businesses, and we were involved in that. I was in a management consulting business. And so oftentimes people say to me, uh, I was interviewed recently, they said, well, you know, we want to talk about this, how a nonprofit, faith-based organization is run like a business or the business principles, right? And so for us, you know, we utilize as we measure all the metrics, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're disruptors, you know, and uh, or people will say, no, you're the disruptor. That's what they tell me. I can relate to that. And so, uh, <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll buy that and say, yes. Yeah. So what happens is, is we think that we do something unique because we approach it as very entrepreneurial. Yeah, we're faith-based. Yeah, we're a nonprofit organization. But we don't take money from churches or government. It's all private source money. So dollars are really important. And I've got to get, for every dollar, I've got to get a return about 10 times that very, very quickly. So we measure everything in metrics. We use a, a product called Salesforce, which in the commercial marketplace is like the product to use to, to manage customers okay. and clients and all that. So we use high-powered tool sets. And, um, you know, we do analytics, and I was doing AI before AI. Really? So we can project yeah. what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So we measure everything. We know on a day-to-day basis we run about 40 miles on the, tr- on the box truck, right? We know what the cost is per hour. We know that 
the days they have me driving the box truck, it seems like I'm doing 90 miles. I think they punish me. <laughs> and so we're doing 90 miles. But we Do you need a special license to drive the no, box truck? No, no? You okay. Get, you don't need a CDL. You just need to have been a person who can drive one <laughs> and had some experience. But what happens is I think that in the nonprofit world, this is not that I'm the smartest or the best or anything like that, but this is the way to go, right? Because the pot's not big enough for money, and everybody's got to compete for it. So you've oh, got to yeah. approach things uh-huh. differently. And so we get a bigger, bigger return. What we do for hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, most organizations, their, their burn rate and expenses we millions, millions of dollars. Yeah. Okay, so what we have done is proven. And so uh, business people really gravitate towards that. Right? And they all like to talk to me about the business side of things, you know, how we, how we approach things. So I'll say to them, well, if we look at organizationally, put the faith piece off to the side. If we look organizationally, we are a retail organization, we're a wholesale distributor, and we focus on logistics. That's what we do mm-hmm. to measure each and everything. And then I'll say, oh, that's interesting. And then what I'll do is I'll bring it back around and I'll say, you know what my balance sheet is? Now look at my, well, your financial, no. How many people we serve every year, every day, every month, and how well we do it? That's the balance sheet. How many do you serve? This year will probably be well over 12,000. Wow. We've been growing, wow. at, you know, from, we went from 5,000 to 7, 8, and now we're 10, 11,000, 12. And it's through our distributors. We have over 50 distributors. So we provide the product, and they distribute it. Okay. So think of it as in business terms, okay? Yeah. Uh, i got to be careful when I say these things because I have to say in business terms, not in nonprofit world, right? But in business terms is to be able to say that it's almost like a franchise we built. We have 50 distributors. Okay. So now bring it into church life. The diocese has about 180 parishes. Mm-hmm. Same model. The distribution of the message, the gospel, the teachings of Jesus, that God loves you, is through a distribution system of over 180 parishes throughout the diocese. Wow, yeah. So I do this in a nonprofit world, okay? No different. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple, and it's easy to do. (laughs) I'm glad you think so. That's great. Bishop may disagree with yeah. me, I would add, but, uh, but it's, that's, that's the way that it works. So mm-hmm. we have a distribution, and that's what's creating these enormous numbers. Some people will say to me, it's great, it's great, you know. I'll say, it's sad, because for an organization like ours, to be at that level, okay, speaks to the need, the changes. We're ser- serving more people now that are mid to late 80s, uh, live in suburbia. Really? Live in uh, a Rocky River, a Bay Village, a Seven Hills, a Brecksville, a Broadview Heights. And what happens is the husband passed away, the surviving spouse or the wife passed away, surviving spouse is late 80s. Um, all their money went into the house and to the kids. It wasn't a six-figure household income. Right. Um, and they're cash poor. Hmm. And they live in a house that needs a driveway, windows, and a roof. And they're cash poor. They've lived long enough where they've exceeded their right. financial resource. Right. That is the fastest growing segment. And so the sociologists that we talk to about this, they call it the new tsunami. Wow. I've, oh, really? I've heard that phrase, yeah. It's a new tsunami. So what happens is, so in, in parishes... Mm-hmm. You know, we always go back to our seniors, you know, because they've been financially supporting parishes forever and ever, but to be able to understand that it's tough for many of them, right? Medicare Part D, the cost of prescription, all the other things that have come into play, right, that are all factored in. And so how much they can give is challenging, right? And so we see that on a regular basis. And we put a lot of furniture in houses in which the furniture was broken, really old and you know we do it in the most respectful way possible and um, that's the fastest growing segment because think about this uh, you probably know somebody's 100 years of age yeah 
you're going to know a lot of people yeah. who are 100 years of age, and they're going to be parishioners here. Mm-hmm. So the dynamics change. and so I just had two burials recently. Yeah. So the dynamics change. So we're from, from the early ages all the way to the advanced senior ages, mm. and our call is to be able to serve all of them. And that's, I think that in COVID disrupted a bit of that. If it wasn't for that, and we, didn't, we were only down three weeks during COVID, but if, if that did, just did not disrupt, I think about 10% to 15% of the people we serve would be um, people of advanced age. We do it in low-income, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. low-income senior centers, but it would be categorically a growing population. Hmm. And so we, we see more and more people that are um, in need that are much, much older. They played by the rules, did everything right, right. raised their families, yeah. did everything right, supported their churches. And now at, at an age, it's, you know, they're pushing close to 90 years of age. Um, financially, they have to be very careful. And it is a very much expanding it's it's a very much expanding community in general. It is. It's um, something that old people would not understand right now. You mentioned artificial intelligence, and I'd yeah. like just to hear everybody. That's the new word right now. Right. Everybody's wondering what it is. They're either terrified or excited or whatever. What is artificial so, intelligence, so, and how so do you use it? It is confusing, is what it is, and it's a tool and a crutch that's used. So here's how I use it. Okay, I and I was kind of facetious as I said that. So what we end up doing is. We could predict with, with accuracy. So here's an example of how I use it. Um, I take the top 10 zip codes where we provide services. Mm-hmm. Okay? We know everything. We know how many households. We know the population. We know the health disparities. We know how many kids. We know the incomes. We know disease patterns and so on and so forth. How do you find that out? Well, some of it's public record, but we have, okay. research, I have people who do research for us too. Okay. So it's to be able to say, so... We have taken this data, and we could forecast forward to say these are things that are likely to happen. So those top 10 zip codes um, have been the top 10 zip codes for the last 10 years. We know it. We know who they are, where they are, and we have a pretty good idea what they need. So we can very quickly, easily look at, at what they need and predict what they need. We have um, the ability to predict how many couches we need over the next three months. So here's an example. We have, on any given day, about um, 75, 85 people who have requested services. Mm-hmm. Well, we know what they want. How many couches, how many chairs, how really? many tables. We know what they want, because we ask them. So they call us and say, I need help. Well, what do you need? And we walk them through, okay. Or the referral agencies, you know, Catholic Cherries Cosgrove Center. They send referrals to us. Well, tell us what they need, not just who they are. Uh So we have all that, right? And so what we end up doing is looking at that. And on the flip side, the 60 or 70 in the pipeline of donors coming in, we know what they're donating. So we'll look at this is what the demand is. This is what the supply is. Are we going to be short? Are Mm -hmm, we going to be okay, mm -hmm. right? So we're looking at this constantly, and we spend a lot of time. For us, we have to have product. We have to have inventory. If I don't have something to give you, I have nothing to offer you as far as furniture and repurposing. So we look at that very carefully, and we monitor that and look at it and keep running, projecting numbers to say, okay, this is what's going to happen. You know, during the winter season, when things slow down a little bit from donations, how do we make sure we have enough supply to get us through maybe the month of January? Yeah, yeah. So we look at these things, and we could predict based upon that information that's mm-hmm. outstanding. So artificial intelligence, there's much, you know, unlimited information. Right. So you can actually, if you want to um, need some help on a homily, mm-hmm. okay? So you go to artificial intelligence. You got my attention okay? right now. <laughs> there you go. So what you end up doing is you could say, well, the Gospel of Matthew, okay? And let's use the Beatitudes. hmm one of my favorites. Yeah. All right. Why? So, because if if that will be the the the, the gospel at my funeral. Yeah. Okay. Because it speaks to life. It speaks to. It's the um, in my view, it's the manual how we're supposed to live our life, and here's the rewards associated with if you try to do these mm-hmm. things. All right. 
and I just think it's so powerful. So if you went in and you put in um, in in an AI one of the AI you know tools that are out there and say, what would be a good homily based upon the Gospel of Matthew and Beatitudes? And next thing you know, you're going to get information. Now the problem is some of it may not be accurate. Yeah. So you would look at it and say, well, wait a minute. Scripturally, that's not right. Mm-hmm. Theologically, that's not right. And that's just dead wrong. But boy, here are about three things I didn't think about. And so it, um, it's just fascinating like any other tool, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. It's like a Google search, right? Right. It, it, Same thing. You got to be careful. It's more complex. Yeah. You got to be careful, right? And so you can't just take things as mm-hmm. a leap of faith and jump. And so what we do is we use everything at our disposal to, to be better today right, than yesterday, because if we're better today and tomorrow, we're going to do a better job helping someone. Yeah. You know, tomorrow morning at, um, at 9 o'clock, we're going to be in a house, and we're going to bring a hospital bed into that house. And this fellow had been associated with, with I'm in ministry, and um, he's got pretty serious health issues. And our job is to make him as comfortable as we possibly can. And we'll be at his house tomorrow morning, put a wow. hospital bed in his house. Oh, my gosh. And so tomorrow night, hopefully it'll be a little bit better for him. That's a holy moment. It's a holy moment. Yeah. And he helped me get there mm. because I learned a lot from this person. And, you know, and tomorrow we'll have about eight placements. Every one will be a holy moment. They help make, him, they help make me better. And help me understand the true teachings of Jesus. Yeah. Right? Because Jesus didn't do drive-bys. Mm-hmm. You know, let somebody else worry about you. He stopped, was present, listened, helped. And I think if, if we have that gnawing in our heart, like knowing we need to help in some way, this could be a practical way to do it. I remember when I became uh, a priest... So in the seminary, you're kind of broke, <laughs> right? That's what I hear. But, but they need furniture. No, they don't need furniture. We just had a huge campaign for them. But when I became a priest and I finally got stipends for things or whatever, I was excited because I could finally, like, without guilt, like, without prudence, give. Mm-hmm. You know, so one of the ways or understanding is, is tithing, that we can give 10% of, of everything right. that, that we receive. And I, I ne- it never bothers me to, to ask people or invite people to give because I know scripturally, mm-hmm. you know, that if we give, God will give us not only a hundred right. times in this life, but eternal life right. to come, right? It's a pretty good deal. Right. So good um, investment. It's a great investment. <laughs> but it excites me now to be able to know that I can and I can give. And so there's many people that are not in our situation. Mm-hmm. We're not on that side of the road. We're on this side of the road, and we can, we can give. Correct. And it sounds like with I'm in ministry, there's numerous ways that they can give, right? So the the old adage in stewardship, right? Time, Time talent, talent, treasure, treasure. right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it's to be able if you give, you know, and if you're if you're and you believe and you trust and you know you're in completely, you figure it out and say. You know, I can give all three. Mm-hmm. Okay, so sometimes it's people say it's easier just writing a check. Yeah. Okay, and you know, I. It's not I'm, a bad thing, right? I'm, you know, <laughs> if if they told me, you know, I got to go see someone to get a check, I'm going. Right? Uh huh. But at the same time, I will also say, but you know, your talent, and and so your treasure, but your time and your talent, and I think that I encourage that. So. Somebody gives us whatever. I'm encouraging people to help other people. Um, I'm a big believer in mentoring. Yeah. So if you if you support your your parish, right, and um, and you give, uh, you tithe or whatever. Don't just say, "Well, I do enough because I write a check." Right. We need more than a check. We need your talent. Mm-hmm. We need your talent. You know, become a mentor here. Come in and talk to the, the to the teen group. Come in and talk to the college people. Come and talk to the young people that are out working in, in, in jobs that are like challenging, difficult, or they're not sure. Where am I going? Um, spend time, that time in sharing, right? 
And I've learned that when you do that, you actually learn more than the person you're helping. But to be able to offer that, and I think today in, in, in the world that we're in and just, the, just a lot of topsy-turvy and, you know, am I going to the office two days a week, three days a week? I don't like my job anymore because now i got to go in three days a week versus not mm-hmm. going, you know, working at home and all of that. I think to be able to have good mentors to help with the practical. And what I think happens is this, and this is what happens with us clergy, and I'm guilty of it at times. You know, I hit them with the Bible stuff, right, the church stuff and all of that. And meanwhile, a person saying, I got three kids. I'm barely making my mortgage. Right. I got a wife that's mad because I'm not at home because I got to work long hours. I got to do all these things. And I got a lot of pressure. And oh, by the way, I got a parent that's aging mm. and is now starting to develop with some memory issues. They need to be able to say, okay, let's just talk how to sort the life stuff out. Right. We'll get to the faith stuff in a moment. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's we'll get, get your head above the water right let's, now. Yeah. Exactly. Let's get your head above water Mm -hmm. because you're not going to get the message right now because you're underwater, right? Yeah. And I think that to be able to have those types of of relationships in a parish is so important because everybody struggles, right? Everybody has a good day, but everybody has a challenging day. And so I, I remember years ago I was at a parish and a priest said to the congregation, it was a large parish, he says, for those of you who came in late today, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I thought to myself, we I'm a guest. no idea. I'm thinking, man, you're going to get some emails, right? Mm-hmm. So afterwards, he says to me, what did you think about that? Now, I'm just a guest, right? So I'm there for the weekend. I'm, I'm just doing a homily at one of the masses. I said, well, here's what I believe. There's a woman that probably had a park at the farthest end of your parking lot has two or three kids. Her husband didn't come to help, and he's mm-hmm. like the fourth kid. She traveled this week, had to go to Chicago on work, you know, Just and had to all to get, yeah. And she's come. We should be applauding and saying, What a hero. Yeah. Thank you for being here, right? Mm-hmm. And embracing versus calling her out, right? Yeah. And, um, and so I think that life issues are really important. I think young people are struggling today by... You know, I wanted to be uh, an attorney, okay, or some other type of uh, a professional or whatever. I wanted to go in tech services, whatever, and I'm not happy. I think mentoring could be really great. You know, if we get them oh, to yeah. help and, 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 and to stabilize. So where I'm going with this is we, we appreciate the treasures, mm-hmm. okay, but we need your time and talent too. And I think parishes that have that spirit – it all comes together then. Yeah, yeah. Because right? we're going to get to the gospel. We're going to get to the message of right. Jesus. We're going to get to how much God loves you. We're going to get there, okay? But, you know, let's put out the burning fire first, all right? And we'll get to the other part of it, and we're going to weave it all in together. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of people, um, you know, how do I deal with these life issues? And, and when they come, some people don't articulate that. But it's easy to, to say in a parish, I know it's out there, and I just want people to know. And I want people who want to volunteer to get involved in that, to say, you know, let's have a mentoring program. We'll teach you how to write a resume. Yeah. Right? We have a woman um, down in Richfield. Uh, she's been with us for years. This is pretty neat what she does. Um, she's very talented, so she gives of her time and her talent, and she gives donations to in ministry. But here's how it works. At the high school, um, I think it's Revere High School. So if you're a junior uh, and as, uh, going into your senior year or just to the beginning of your senior year, she will help you in your college application. Mm. Okay? And she'll help you with that and just work everything out so you got a great application. She'll help you with the resume. But she charges nothing. But what she says is you have to bring oh, that's cool. three bags of clothing that's cool. for I'm in ministry <laughs> right and so um, and we get a phone call but she's helping these young people and she's just she's just wonderful right just a wonderful person and so she sits down with these young people 
And you know what? And she's helping with the application, but they're getting a lot more out of it. Mm-hmm. And I think about her, so she gives of her time and her talent. And so I think that in, in church life today, we need to have financial gifts, but we need that time, we need their talent. Uh, more so maybe than ever. Yeah, oh yeah. And and I think that those parishes that, that embrace that, mm-hmm. or the parish that I had mentioned where they said, hey, we got people who want to be involved in service. Pretty simple. You want a service project, but you can't get it off the ground because uh, you're all by yourself in the parish and you got to do all of the other stuff? Simple. We'll connect, we'll partner, we'll work it out. And every time there's something good to celebrate, your parish gets recognized for it. And um, so I think there's enough for people to get involved if they want to get involved. So I guess the the viewers, I would say, is at your parish, here at St. Matthias, or whatever you do, not only give of your your treasures, but really, truly think about your time. Think about the talent, Mm because everybody has something. I don't think they realize it, though, nor do I know that they always realize that it's applicable. In some way. Well, that's where you help them, right? Yeah. So yeah, what yeah. happens is to give that, give that talent because it could be somebody could say, well, I don't have anything to give, right? You do. Show up. Be present. Mm, good. And I think that's a, um, that's a talent. Yeah. To show up and, and to be present and to listen. Listen is a great skill set, right? To be able to listen and, uh, and then to be able to offer... Uh, I don't tell people what to do. I'll say, are you open to suggestions? Mm-hmm. That's good. That's it's good. called nudge yeah. theory. Right. I don't tell them what to do. Are you open to suggestions? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I may have a suggestion for you. That's good. But I think that's where, that's how people get engaged. And to be able to bring them in and to, to be able to encourage them. So I think as we think about uh, opportunities for volunteers, we have to create it. Right, and th- I have to create those opportunities, right? And and to say I need your help. I do need the help of volunteers. Mm-hmm. I need your help, and to to be able to create those opportunities, open up the door, build the bridge, help create the highway for them to get there. And when there's clutter on the road, clear it out and keep working towards um, doing the work of God. Yeah. Well, as we come to the end of this, can you give people just some practical things? You know, you, you mentioned they can call. Great. How do they find you? Go to our website, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in ministry.com. Go to our website, and uh, you'll find us there. And you'll see some things about how you can donate furniture and things of that nature, how to get involved. Uh, you know, our contact information is there. Give me a call if, uh, if you'd like to talk about volunteering somewhere, uh, even outside of I'm in ministry. Um, you know, we can help provide some some ideas. We have other volunteers that could help say, here's what it's like to volunteer if you want to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're open and we're receptive. And every time we have a conversation, we learn. And I think that, so that's, that, that's it. How, I don't believe in coincidences. Mm-hmm. I have the privilege of being here with you today because of one of our volunteers Kevin Pugley, who's an ambassador, was out talking about I'm in ministry. And next thing you know, I'm here having the privilege of talking to you about Mm. I'm in ministry. He made that happen. He's a volunteer at I'm in ministry. That's cool. Guy's an ambassador. He's just a wonderful person. So it's it's to be able to just encourage people. Just get in. I guess the message would be this. Be engaged, right? Show up. Come back. Be engaged. And in the wonderful words of somebody we both respect, uh, Father Jim O'Donnell, mm-hmm. show up and be present. Amen. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much, Deacon, My, for being with you. us today. I, appreciate, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you, your time, and all the technical people here today help making this possible, and your wonderful parishioners. So they, to all yes. the St. Matthias parishioners that helped me be here today, Thank you. Thank you. A, date, uh, a great uh, debt of gratitude to all of you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, they're tremendous. Uh, they love giving. They love serving. I thought one more uh, thing. I thought it was really neat to hear you say that parishes, too, if they don't 
know how to create service opportunities can contact you. They so. do. So one of the examples is uh, parishes are supporting Ukrainian families. Yeah. They call us and mm-hmm. say, we need help. Can you get furniture and so on? So we work very closely with Resurrection, uh, Father Draga and that group out there. It's, we worked out really well. And um, we are actually, uh, we have just been approved. We're sponsoring a, fa- a Ukrainian family. Yeah, it's family. exciting. Yeah. Uh, so they should be here hopefully in July. Yeah. And so uh, when you get involved in things like that, and they need furniture and all that. Yeah. That's easy. And so our viewers, too, you can just share this. If you can think of somebody, maybe it's somebody at your parish or someone that might benefit just from learning about this, that's the that's God's providence, too, as well. So It's the baptismal call. So mm-hmm. whether it's I'm in ministry or something else or here in your parish, yeah, the baptismal call, get engaged, be involved, and be that disciple to the best of your ability. So when you meet God, you can say, I did my best. Amen. Thank you, Deacon Luke. God bless you. Thank you very much.